Glory. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. Give up praise. Come on. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Come on. He is worthy. He is worthy. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 No greater. Thank you, Lord. No one greater than our God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Oh, come on. Are you ready to praise the Lord?
Hallelujah, Father. We humbly come before you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day, for this night. We bless you, and we thank you. Give you all praise, honor, and glory, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the breath of life and life itself, Father. We thank you for our, our sanctuary, Lord. We thank you for our gathering center, center, Lord. We thank you for the children, teachers, and helpers, Lord. We thank you for security. We thank you for your leaders and neighbors, Lord. We thank you for the associate pastors and their families, Father. We lift up Apostle Rocky, Pastor Bobby, and Benaiah right now that you would consume them now with your fresh fire, Lord God, and anointing, Lord God, and prepare as they prepare for their mission, Lord, in California, Lord, that you would touch them right now, release ministering angels to be all about them, Father. We thank you for the blood of Jesus to cover them and to protect them on their way, traveling mercies upon them in Jesus' name. We thank you for our online family that you would reach out and touch them, Father, where they're at right now, Lord. We thank you for their love and support. We thank you, Father, for the uh, worship pastor, the youth pastor, and their family, Father. We thank you for your missionary, Lord. We thank you for your pastors preaching the uncompromised word of God worldwide, Lord, lifting up our country, our state, Father, our government right now. We bless you, giving you all praise, honor, and glory. And we give you glory and we praise you. We can't stop thanking you, Lord. We can't stop worshiping you, Lord. We can't stop loving you, Lord. We love you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and say amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, everybody. Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. As you see, I have the privilege and the honor of delivering the word tonight. Amen. Um, I was actually given the, the notice a week ago. So I had a whole week to study. And I did it really well. I was done by Monday night, you know, Tuesday morning. I called in the title and the scripture to Pastor Holulu. And as I was going over my notes today, God started giving me more information. Now, I don't know who the information is for, for you or for me. Um, but praise God, because I have information. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And uh, I just thank you for your seed and that you have planted in me and for me and my family. Just thank you and appreciate it. Don't take it lightly. I know everyone works hard for their, for their, their, their money and their funds. And, and I just thank you that you guys all have a giving heart. Amen. So the title for tonight is Follow Me. Um, I cannot say that it's a brand new message or a brand new title, but it is the, it is the title that God gave me. And like I said, I have some information. Hopefully it helps you. I know it did me. Um, as I was reading the scripture, and studying all these flashbacks, all these memories from when I was a, a kid to my teenage years, my adulthood. And they're like, wow, so many testimonies, so many, so many different things to share. So I hope that I can share what God wants me to share. Amen. Again, thank you for your seed, everybody. Hallelujah. So, follow me. If we turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and I'm reading out of the CSB or the Christian Standard Bible. Amen. And the word of God reads, follow me, he told them. And I will make you fish for a people. Hallelujah. Just thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for the message. I pray that you'd speak through me. 
and get your message to your people, Father God, and we just give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. And that was the, the, the Christian Standard Bible. In the King James, it reads, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Um, when I first got saved, and I read that scripture, it kind of spoke to me, because I was in the phase of my life where I was fishing and diving a lot. Amen? And, uh, and there was, back then, there was a couple brothers in the church that they were just as hardcore as I was. And, you know, and we would go diving whenever we could. But as I began to follow Christ, the activities that I did changed. I didn't go fishing in the literal ocean anymore, or not as much anyway, not as much diving. And I began to learn to be a disciple, amen, and following Christ. In the NIV, it says, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I send you out to fish for a people. In the New Living Translation, translation Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for a people. Amen. There's a proverb. I'm sure a lot of you heard it. It goes like this. If you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Amen? Amen. And you can apply that to, to, to the scriptures. You give a man a scripture, you feed him for the day. You teach him how to have a devotion, you feed him for a lifetime. Amen? Because he'll continually have the word of God in him. Continually, day after day after day. And pretty soon, like Apostle shares, your opinion becomes the word of God. Everything you judge, you judge by the word of God. Amen? Amen? Even your own actions, you should be judging by the word of God. Are you following him? Back in the biblical times, fishermen used nets, baskets, spears, hook and line, and sometimes their bare hands to catch fish. Fishing was hard work. Amen. I fish nowadays, but I fish for enjoyment. I go down the beach, I throw my lines out, and I hang out all day. I enjoy the sun, I enjoy the conversations, and we just hang and chill, you know? The three main fishing methods, netting, spearing and using a hook and line. Now I've done all three and the methods haven't changed much since, since those, those times. But technology has changed the fishing, amen? You got bigger boats, you have ele um, battery powered winches to haul up the nets, you got fish finders to help you find the fish, amen? Yeah. And if you go like we used to uh, watch the guys go uh, coolie fishing. They get the plane, go around and around, and they spot all the fish. And then they send out the boat, right? So they know exactly where the fish are, right? Well, like I said, I've done all three. Growing up, when I was a young boy, my dad was really into the, the, the lay netting. So we would lay nets overnight. We would lay nets for half an hour or whatever, you know, we call it pie pie, you just splash the water. And then as I, I got older, I learned how to taco dive and spear fish. And then all the fishermen, you know, the ultimate goal, they want to catch the big ulua, amen? So they go hook and line, specifically for ulua, or what they call the giant trevally. They want to be part of that 100 pound club, amen? <laughs> that's my goal 
even though if I hook the 100 pound of lure, my fishing poles probably wouldn't uh, handle it right now. Um, netting has, has always been the best way to fish commercially. It is possible to catch the most amount of fish in the least amount of time. Amen? Amen. When you throw a line, maybe you catch one fish. Maybe two, if you do like a setup like I do. If you go off the boat, maybe you fish, you can get five or six. But netting has always been the most e effective. Amen? And back in Jerusalem, or in, in the Sea of Galilee, the main three types of fish caught were these. Um, it's called the musht, or, yeah, we know it as the tilapia, right? St. Peter's fish, amen? There's a story where, where Jesus told him to go cast a line and a hook and get the coin out of the fish's mouth to pay the taxes, the temple taxes, amen? I have yet for that to happen. <laughs> and there's another fish called the biny. And it's almost... The description shares that it has barbels underneath the chin. So it's almost like what we call the veke or the kumu, you know. It has the barbels that feels for the crustaceans in the sand. And then the last one was the sardines. Okay. They also caught catfish and carp. The catfish, to the Jews, it was unclean because it didn't have scales. All right, so they would catch it, but they would sell it in the market. So we're going to talk about the netting right now. Not so much about the other, the other methods, right, but net netting. There are three parts to the net. There's the head rope which is on the top, has floaters, and it keeps the line above the rest of the net, okay? And that is tied, to that is tied the mesh. A and in between that is the mesh. And there are different sizes, you know, de depending on the target fish you're gonna catch. If you wanna go illegal or you, go, you know, the nehu, <laughs> quarter inch eye. But if you're going for like say, uh, Kala or Nenui, right? Bigger eye because bigger fish. Amen? And then there's the foot rope at the bottom. And that has weights, or we used lead, but back then they would use stones to weigh the net down. So it keep it close to the bottom or to the lower part of the ocean or the, 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 the water so that the fish would go through and get, get caught. Amen? So those are the three, type, uh, three parts of the net. And the first method that they used is called a drag net. Okay? It's one of the oldest methods and it uses the three components of the net. The head rope, the mesh, and the foot rope. Now the drag net, they would start from shore, they would take the net out, and then they would go parallel to the shore, and then come back into the shore. And then the men would start pulling it in. Kind of like what the Hawaiians call the hukilo, right? You could set the net right around, you come back to the shore, and then everybody pulls it in. Everybody helps one another. The bigger the net, the more people you need, amen? And if you want examples of that, you can go to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, Ezekiel 26, verse 5 and 14, Ezekiel 47, verse 10, and Matthew 13, 47 and 48. So that was the dragnet. So it took a lot of work. And you imagine you gotta stretch out the net, make your 
make your area where you're going to surround and then you got to drag it in and if there was a lot of fish the net became heavier right okay, and then the second method I never I, I haven't participated in the hooky law but I've seen it amen and it looks like fun Pull the net in every you know the song everybody go in to hooky law right but the second method is the cast net now this I have tried <laughs> and participated in the net is circular in shape there is no head rope so the top rope is eliminated right but it comes to one central point and then from there you got the mesh then you have the, the foot rope and the foot rope is attached to the outer diameter of the net right and the foot rope again has the weights so it sinks quickly now it is cast or thrown by a single person and when you throw it it opens up like a parachute and it traps whatever fish is below it Amen. Now, I was taught when I was younger how to cast the net, how to throw the net. My problem is I don't have the patience to look for the fish. <laughs> yeah. So, my uncle, he was the he was the the one who threw the net a lot. But he was smart. He would come pick up, pick us up, me and my brother, and we would go to the beach. And while we were swimming over here, he was over here looking for the fish. Amen. And he'd spend hours, hours. We'd go in the morning, and we wouldn't come home till the afternoon, but he would spend hours walking up the shore, looking at the fish. There's a certain way to read the fish, you know. He would set it up. He would stalk the fish. And then just before he threw, the fish would swim away. He would rest again, and then go through the same process. Looking for the fish, you know. They say that the timing is, when the wave comes in, the fish face outward. So you have to time it so that when the fish face outward, that's when you want to throw, because they can't see you, because they're looking out, right? But when the wave's going out and the fish is facing in because they're trying to fight the, the waves or the current, they're looking towards shore and they can see you. So you gotta time your movements, amen? But my job was, after my uncle cast the net, my job was to put on the mask and go, ca go gather all the fish, go gather all the net together, amen? And then he would go on with another net and go down and, and do another cast, right? And it, it just it just brought a lot of brought back a lot of memories. My uncle used to live up country, and he would sew his nets and he'd come down, and he would hang his his mesh from the the mango tree in our backyard, and he would weight it down so that all the knots in the net got tight. And he would exchange. He would bring my family fish from whatever he caught. And we would exchange and give him vegetables or pork or chicken because we raised pigs and, and chickens. And we would, we would exchange, you know. I remember this one time. My uncle threw the net. And it was my job to go get the net. So I went in and I got the net. And he went further out and he made another cast. So he, he cast on the second school. He got all the net, he brought it up, and I was still struggling with mine. Amen. But somehow, I turned the net inside out. So <laughs> when he went to untangle all the fish, the net was upside down, and he had to, well, he got mad. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
Uh, he didn't yell at me, but I know he was mad because the tone of his voice changed, amen. But it just brought back all the memories, you know. And so we go fishing now. I still have my net. I have a net. It's in my truck. It goes wherever I go. I haven't thrown it yet. <laughs> One day I will, amen. And the last method, or the last net, is called a trammel net. Now, we never had a net like this. And when I, when I was studying, it, it, it took me by surprise. Because the net, this trammel net has the head rope, which is the top rope with all the floaters. But it has three different meshes. So you have one size of mesh on the outside, another size of mesh on the other outside, but in the middle, it was a finer mesh. So no matter which way the fish was swimming, once they hit the center mesh, they would swim right through and they get tangled in the big mesh. Amen? Now this method, they usually used the boats and they took it out to deeper water. And they would set the, the net parallel to the shore. And then after it was set, and the boat would come inside, and they would, they would start splashing the water. Yeah. We would call it Pai Pai. We would splash the water, make a lot of noise, throw rocks so the fish get scared and run into the net. And then you could go down. After, it was, after all the, net, the fish was in the net, you could go down and pick it out one by one, or you could grab, grab all the net. So when you read in the Bible, when I read in the Bible that the fishermen were mending their nets and drying their nets, we kind of did the same thing. When we would go pie pie, we would go lay net. We have to come home and we would stretch out the net. My dad made this rack, we would stretch out the net. We had to clean all the limo all the seaweed out of the net so that the next time we could use it again. Amen. And it was easier to pull out the limo or the seaweed when it was dry. So we'd dry the net and we'd take it all out. And we'd go section by section and take out all the... And then whenever there was holes in the net, we would have to sew. Amen. And as a young kid, I remember it's called a needle. Right? You know, when you saw it, there's a needle. But you have to fill it up with all the line so that you could make the mesh. But that was my job. I had to fill up all the line. And I had all these needles, and I, I enjoyed it. Just filling it up, filling it up. Then I'd watch my dad tie the knots and sew and fix and mend the nets. You know, so as I was reading this, I was like, man, I remember doing that. You know? But now, Jesus walks by, and he says, Hey, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Amen? Now, it's not, that's not just an ordinary invitation. Fishermen, by occupation, were common folk. They weren't royalty. They were like what you call middle class, I guess. Yeah, they weren't they weren't poverty. But they had to work hard. That was their livelihood. If they didn't catch fish, they didn't eat. If I don't catch fish, I can go to uh Oki's Point in Foodland. <laughs> right? <laughs> I can go to the Tamuros and get poke. Yeah. Back then, if you didn't catch fish, you didn't eat. And if it was your livelihood, you couldn't make money. You couldn't buy the other necessities. Amen? So to be called by the Messiah, follow me, it was an honor to them. It was such an honor that they dropped everything. Right?
how many fishermen does it take to change a light bulb? Any guesses? How many fishermen does it take to change a light bulb? Just one. But you should have seen the light bulb. It was this big. <laughs> Amen. I, I've had a few of those, you know. You know, oh yeah, you know. The, 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 I shot one ulua, it was this big. You know. Oh, I saw a hundred pound ulua when I was diving. <laughs> I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> the light bulb. <laughs> it was this big. Okay, all right. This big. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, so fishing was hard work. And follow me wasn't just an ordinary invitation. It was a command. It was a call to obedience. Amen. Follow me means immediate detachment from personal interest and attachment to Christ. It's a call. Follow me. Now, if you've read your Bible, you know that the, the, the apostles, the disciples were called at the Sea of Galilee. Right? They, were in the, they were in the fishing boats. They are mending their nets. Jesus calls them. In, 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 in the, the book of Luke, Jesus tells them to go cast the net. And they said, ah, we haven't caught anything all night, but at your word, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. And then they caught a big catch, right? Their friends had to come and help them. And as soon as they got back to shore, they left it all behind. And they followed Christ. Follow me means immediate detachment from personal interest and attachment to Christ. Hallelujah. So after the crucifixion, there's a point where the disciples returned to what they knew. They didn't know what to do, right? So they said, Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. And everybody said, oh, I'll come with you. Let's all go fishing. But it's the same place that Christ reappears to them. And he says, have you caught anything? And they said, no. He said, oh, cast the, cast the net on the right side. And they had a big catch. And Peter, knowing that it was Jesus, he got excited. He jumped out of the boat, swam to shore, right? But the same place where he first called them is the same place that he called them again. So if you remember, in between that, Peter denied Christ three times. Right? They arrested Jesus. Peter followed. And in the courtyard, he denied Christ three times. And the cock crew. Right? Now, when he, reappear, he reappears to them on the shore and he calls them, after they eat, he asks Peter three times, do you love me? Peter, do you love me?
Peter, do you love me? And he says, Peter was grieved because he said, Jesus, you know that I love you. Right? If Jesus asked you, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? How would you feel? Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Come on, you know I love you. So he asked Peter three times, do you love me? But Jesus was trying to make a point. He was trying to show Peter, not him, he already knew, but he was trying to show Peter, I know you love me. And after each, I love, after each time Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Peter said yes. There was a command. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And later on, if you go to John chapter 21, In verse 18, it reads, Another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So, Jesus shared to Peter how he was going to die, right? In other translations, it says, when you were young, you went wherever you went. You wanted to go. You clothed yourself, and you just went. But when you get old, somebody else is going to dress you. Somebody else is going to carry you to where you don't, you don't want to go. And it, I, didn't, I didn't quite get it when I, when I studied this, how they inferred that Jesus was going to die on a cross until I went to study. Okay, so... When he told Peter that somebody else was going to carry him and would dress him and would take him where he didn't want to go, he was showing Peter that Peter's faith wasn't going to fail him again. He was going to go to the cross where he didn't want to go, but he would not deny Jesus Christ again. Amen? Because even to death, he wouldn't deny Christ again. Now that doesn't make him perfect, right? Doesn't make any one of us perfect if we decide to follow Christ. But there will be sacrifice. Amen. When he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Now, as I studied, they said that when Peter went to, to the cross to be crucified, he asked them to be, that he could be crucified upside down because he wasn't equal to what Jesus to Jesus, to, to die the same death that Jesus did. So he has to be turned upside down, crucified upside down, amen. 
How many of you ever had a head rush? <laughs> Where you, you bend down to pick something up, and when you stand up, you, whoa, get dizzy. It's because the, all the blood flowed to your head for a quick, 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 quick moment. And when you got up, it's like, whoa, there's no, there's no blood up there. Can you imagine hanging upside down? Yeah. What? Oh. Break again. How did the oyster manage to hide from the fish? No? Where's Banai? Oh, Banai's not here. Banai, are you listening? How did the how did the oyster hide from the fish? Clamouflage. <laughs> All right. What do you call a fish with cable? <laughs> Television. <laughs> okay, enough jokes for now. Some some fun facts that I f that I that I looked up. Seahorses are monogamous; they mate for life. Now, I started diving when I was probably about eight years old, nine years old learning how to dive taco. And uh, in all my years of diving, I haven't seen a seahorse in the wild. Until one day, we were snorkeling, diving for taco, and I was trying to teach my son how to dive for taco. But sometimes when they're young, they're not, they don't pay attention, right? They, they just, they're not following you they're off there on their own. But he called me, and he's all, he was all excited. And I was like, what? You know, I'm busy. I'm looking for taco. I need bait for fishing. And I'm hungry, too. But he calls me over, and I go over, and he's pointing to the sand. And I'm like, what are you pointing to? There's, no, there's just sand and seaweed. What are you pointing to? And he goes, look good, Dad. Look good. So I stopped and I was like, okay, it's gotta be something. And I looked good. And at the very tip of the seaweed, there was a seahorse in the wild. Not in a fish tank, not in an aquarium, but in the wild. And I was like, I was blown away. I was like, oh, wow. 40 years, 40 something years, I've never seen one. <laughs> wow. And I, I was really excited. And I actually got to see one in the wild. And it, it, it had his tail curled around the seaweed, and it was just kind of floating around. And I was like, I was in awe. I was like, wow. It's the first time. I've seen Taco dance like that in the seaweed, you know? <laughs> There's one time we were diving for Taco, and the seaweed's going back and forth like this, and my brother tells me, check it out, watch, look, look. I'm like, well, what are you looking at? He said, watch the seaweed. So the taco's like this, the seaweed goes this way, the taco goes this way, the seaweed goes that way, the taco goes that way. But he lost his rhythm. The seaweed went that way, and he went that way, and I saw him. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I got you now. Amen. <laughs> but yeah. 40-something years diving, and only once in my life I've seen a seahorse. Fish fact number two. Most elephants weigh less than the tongue of a blue whale. I was like, wow, that's big. Just the tongue. Not the whole whale, just the tongue weighs more than most elephants. Wow. 
and a clownfish. You guys know what a clownfish, right? You guys all saw Nemo? Yeah. Right? All clownfish are born male and will only change sex to become a dominant female. So all clownfish, you know, orange, really white, and black stripes, Nemo, they're all born male. And they only change sex to become a dominant female. And fish fact number four says, once a giant clam picks a spot to live on, on a reef, it doesn't move for the rest of its life. Now the giant sea clams, if you don't know, they can grow to be about 100 years old and they get very big. And from what I hear, they taste really good. Yeah. My brother-in-law tells me about it. Back in Samoa, they used to go pick the, the, the sea clams, big sea clams. They taste very good, very good. Now, I don't know. I can't imagine how it would taste, except maybe like an opihi or... Um, Abalone, yeah. But once it sits, once it parks itself, it's not moving until it dies. It's gonna stay right there. Amen. And that was just some facts that I I found interesting. So, how does a fish stay healthy? He takes vitamin C. <laughs> what do you call a fish that won't shut up? A big mouth bass. And what is the richest kind of fish? This one should be easy. A goldfish. Correct, Joey. A goldfish. Amen? So back to follow me. So I shared that follow me isn't just an ordinary invitation. It's a command. And once you submit to that command, it's a life of obedience. Now, when I, when I gave my life to Christ, I was messed up. And I didn't know everything. I didn't, being a Christian was new to me. Growing up, I went to church, yeah, you know. Um, I have family members that are preachers, I believe, on my dad's side. But being a Christian was all new to me. And if there wasn't somebody to teach me somebody that I could, I could follow, I would still be lost. But that's where our leaders come in, our pastors. In the Tyndale Bible of 1526, 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, follow me as I do Christ. And over the last 24 years, I've learned so much by following our leaders, Pastor Rocky, Pastor Bobby. 
associate pastors. But I had an example. In the NIV, 1 Corinthians 11 1 reads, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In the Amplified, it says, Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. So when you submit to the command, follow me. You have to be obedient. Not perfect, but obedient. Now Peter shows us an example that he messed up. He denied Christ three times. Jesus asked him to reaffirm his love for him three times. But after that, his faith never failed. He went to the cross to be crucified and asked to be hung upside down. he wasn't worthy to be, cru to be crucified as Christ was crucified. A lot of times in that story in John chapter 21 and Jesus asked Peter to follow him a lot of times we like to look on the side and say, what about him? When Peter saw John following him and Jesus, he asked Jesus, what about him? You asked me to follow you, but what about him? Sometimes we do that. What about him? What is he supposed to do? It doesn't matter. It's what Christ called you to do. Amen. It's okay to go help them if they need help. But if it deviates you from your, what you're called to do and what you're supposed to do, you're out of order. Because in the end, when you stand before God, He's not going to ask you, did you help the people down the, down the kind? How did you do? He's going to ask you, what did you do with my command? I asked you to follow me. Jesus said, in my words, so what if he lives until I come again? That's, not up, that's none of your business. Follow me. Amen. So even if we mess up, Jesus is still saying, follow me. Follow me. But that requires a solid relationship. So you go back to, the, to what I shared. You share a scripture with a person, you can feed that person for the day. You teach him how to do a devotion. You feed him for the rest of his life. Now I know most of, the, most of us here, if not all, have a strong devotion. But if you don't have a devotion, I encourage you to start one. So every day, you get the word of God in you. Every day, you have something to draw out of the, out of the Bible, out of the, out of the bank of knowledge and wisdom, the book of life. Amen? Because you cannot draw what you don't have inside of you. For me, I'm blessed. I enjoy reading. I have, I've always enjoyed reading from when I was young. Um, I shared this testimony a lot that even though we were poor or, you know, m middle class, 
somehow, somehow my mom either convinced my dad or found the money to buy me two sets of books. One was the encyclopedia from A to Z, and the other one was the Bible stories. And back then, I was the remote for the, for the TV, right? We only had three stations, or maybe four if you're lucky. No manual remote. I mean, no remote control. It was, boy, change the channel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were lucky if the banana ears were inside on top of the TV. If not, you'd have to go on the roof and adjust the, the antenna. But what it did was, it caused me to read a lot. I mean, we, 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 we had our, our times, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon, had cartoons, checkers and pogo. Young kids, maybe you guys don't remember who they were, but <laughs> checkers and pogo. Saturday morning cartoons, amen. So we had times where we, would, we were able to watch TV without, okay. but on Sundays, Filipino fiesta, that was my dad. You couldn't touch the TV, you couldn't change the channel. And then in the evening, it was the Lawrence Welk Show. Lawrence Welk Show, you know. I don't know about late night, but I think after 11 o'clock, the, the TV would just go blank. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to watch. Now you can watch TV all night long. You got thousands of channels to go through. <laughs> but what it did was it caused me to have a love for reading. So I have an advantage over most people. I enjoy reading. Um, and when I read the Bible today, it comes alive from when I used to read it when I was young. And I had a really good set. I, I believe it was by C.S. Lewis illustrated uh, pictures man it was you know all the, all the David and Goliath the three strand cord I remember all those pictures in, in the Bible stories when I read it in the Bible today I can, I can the pictures actually come back to me and I can see it and I can visualize it and I, I'm blessed but to have a devotion amen that's the whole thing about it have a devotion if you teach a man, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for today. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Now, recently, my fishing has been go down to the beach, throw my poles out, sit down, and wait till the fish come. Okay? But that's not how Jesus wants us to call, to be fishers of men. We need to take every opportunity and every chance that we have to share the gospel, Amen. Amen. to share an encouraging word. Amen. A lot of times he doesn't sh ask us to share scriptures. It's just being who you are, smiling at someone, giving a helping hand, Encouraging them. But it's not just cast it out and then wait. Maybe the fish will bite. Because a lot of times when I throw my, 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 my bait out, I don't know when the bait's gone. Right? So... For every time you share something, you don't know how long that it's going to last. Whether you share love, a handshake, an encouraging word, you don't know how long that bait's going to last. But we're called to reel them in. Yeah, reel them in. So for me, I got to check bait more often. But sometimes I get lazy. I check bait every hour, maybe sometimes two hours. And then when I check the bait, no more bait. No can catch fish, no more bait. I always tell my brother-in-law that. No more fish, no more, no more bait, no can catch fish. Right? Now I wish 
I could throw the net all the time and catch a lot of people. A lot of ministry is one-on-one, right? I mean, you got those big revivals, big, what do you call it, conferences, healing ministry. It's like the dragnet. You send it out and you pull all the people in, drag all the fish in, all right? I like the, the, the lane net, the travel, the travel net. You make all this noise, all this ruckus, and they run into the net, and then you pick them out one by one. Right. A lot of times, ministry is just a hook and line and the bait. Something I know about bait is you've got to use good bait. Yeah. Sometimes the, the bait stink. Hard for catch fish. Maybe the fish is attracted to it, but when you wash your hands and so you... You get the smell when you go home. You gotta wash good. But hook and line, one at a time. Every opportunity, every chance that you get. Let's reel them in. Let's reel them in. Amen. Be aware of those opportunities and those 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 chances to minister and be a, a good Christian. Hallelujah. So follow me as I follow Christ. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you for this word, Father God. We lift up this this service to you, Father God. I pray that your people got something, whether you're watching online or you're in the room tonight. Jesus is sending out that call, follow me. And I want to back it up by saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And if you've never given your your life to to Jesus, or you've never made that decision to to become a disciple, to want to learn what it is to be a Christian, what it is to follow Christ, I'm going to share it's not an easy walk but it's a blessed walk the best decision I've made in my life was to surrender and follow Christ so I'm going to give you an opportunity no matter what you're going through if you have issues you have problems if you're not perfect The word says that Peter wasn't perfect. He denied Christ three times, but Jesus still chose him to spread the gospel, the good news. So if you want to, if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to say, hey, I need help, I need direction. I need strength. Here's an opportunity. And you can repeat after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins and wash me clean. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again the third day that I may have everlasting life and my life will never be the same will never ever ever be the same again in Jesus name Amen Hallelujah if you made that if you repeated that prayer the invitation is sent out follow me Jesus is saying, follow me. Find yourself a good church, a Bible-believing church, one that has good leaders, that you can follow them as they follow Christ. If you don't have a church and you're in Maui, you can come visit us here. If not, call the office on our website, wordertruthmaui.org. 
You can call the office and they'll help you find the church wherever you are in the mainland, Oahu. And if you want to sow a seed and this church is good ground, you can go on the, on the website, the green button. Again, word of truth, maui.org and plant a seed. And I promise you, your life will never be the same. Once you have Jesus in your heart, change is coming. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, everybody.